or unhealthy. And they may go in phases at different times and different phases and different seasons in our lives. But we invited you here today because there is good news if you're dealing with unhealthiness in your life. And the good news is that there is hope. There's hope for change. There's hope for transformation. And so we invited Sonia here today to share her real life story of hope for people especially that are maybe wondering, does transformation apply to me? Is hope something that I can grab onto as well? Is change really possible in my life? So we want to, just by way of introduction, I want you to take a look at this video and get a little background as Sonia comes on up here. Wow. My name is Sonia Jones. I'm a two-time softball All-American. This October, I will officially become the 40-year-old virgin. I've never been in a relationship, ever. And I can't imagine someone wanting to spend their life with me when I don't find myself desirable in, in any way. Why come to The Biggest Loser? For the first time in my life, to focus on me. Yeah. I'm learning to love someone that I didn't even know could exist. Mm. Nice, Sonya! Good heavens. For the first time in my life, I feel beautiful. Words cannot describe to you how grateful and how proud I am of this journey. I have been the biggest loser on the ranch since week five, and I'm not planning to relinquish my title as the biggest loser anytime soon. Yes! Here she is, ladies and gentlemen. Let's hear it for Sonia! So welcome, Sonia Jones. We need to give her a round of applause. You know, I, I get chills every time I watch that kind of stuff. Yeah. You? I am a you sucker. You sports fronts. I mean, it's on national. You know, what I do in my free time is none of your business. That's what your wife said. That's right. That's right. I, uh, I, listen, I'm a sucker for it all. Like, movies like, uh, you know, Rudy and uh, Remember the Titans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so when I and uh, Hoosiers, I don't know what I was thinking of. You know, you watch the ending and you're cheering. And in preparation for today, I was going through old clips of, of the season 16. And the best uh, season ever. What's that? Best season ever. The best season ever, which is what the underlying <laughs> is. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, every time it would come to the weigh-in, you know, I just kept getting, I get these chills, you know. And, and, and I knew how it turned out. I was still nervous and everything. So, uh, for those of you that don't know, I just want. Uh, how many of you are big fans of The Biggest Loser? You, Watch that, watch it all the way through. Now, uh, very good. We, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a background. If you don't know anything, uh, if you've maybe been living under a rock for the last uh, 16 seasons, uh, but you don't have any idea what this show is all about and why we keep referring to our friend here as the biggest loser, that's just not nice in any other world. But uh, in the world of TV, it makes perfect sense because the biggest loser is just a competition reality show that features people competing to win a cash prize and it's all based on the highest percentage of weight loss. It's not on pounds loss, it's on the highest percentage based on what, where they began and where they finished. So this season that Sonia was in, season 16, uh, all the contestants, if I'm right, were all former athletes of, of all different levels. Yep. There's professional, uh, what, there's NFL. NFL, there's an NFL quarterback in Scott uh, Mitchell. Damien Woody was a two-time uh, NFL Super Bowl champion. Lori Harrigan Mack was one of my heroes. She was a three-time gold medalist, All-American for softball. Uh, Zena Garrison was a Wimbledon champion, gold medalist. Yeah, they were stacked this year. They were stacked. And then there were the average Joes like us. Yeah. <laughs> Competing for two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars in prize money on that. But uh, but then, as you're going to hear from Sonia, it's it's even much more than that. It's more than just the money. There's all kinds of things that took place. And so we're so glad, Sonia, that you're here to share part of your story. So why don't you jump in and let us know, how did you get involved in this whole thing in the first place? How did your adventure in The Biggest Loser begin? I have to tell you, I've always loved the show. I love The Biggest Loser. I've watched it since season one. I would sit on my couch, 
with a big old pizza and a two-liter <laughs> soda and be so inspired maybe not to eat the whole large pizza, but a good part of it. And um, I've always loved the show. Actually, in 2009, I did a Facebook post. I'm going to put it up. It's actually, uh, in 2009, I wrote this Facebook post called 25 Random Things About Me. And number 10 on that post, six years ago, was actually, I have a secret desire to be a contestant on Biggest Loser. And now here I am, all these years later, and I've completed that process. So that's, that's really cool. And I love the line where it says, something about watching overweight folks in spandex and sports bra <laughs> really jazzes me. Ew. Now that's me. You know, I'm you know, great. Um, so basically what happened was I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw an ad that said if you were a former athlete or you are a family member because they weren't sure at this point what direction they were going in the casting process. So they said if you're a former athlete or a family, come to an open casting call. It was in um, Itasca, Illinois, and I gotta tell you, as of next Saturday, it is a one year full circle for me. When I stayed at the Biggest Loser Resort last night and I was driving down that road and I started to get choked up because I'm like, this is where it all happened a year ago. You know, it was crazy. But anyway, um, I saw that Facebook post, so I thought I'll fill out an application and I forgot all about it. Six weeks later, I get this um, email that says, we'd love to see you at our open casting call in <laughs> Chicago. Please come. And I thought, well, why would they send me that? And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, I'm overweight. And I filled out an application. <laughs> so I went, and a fun side note, I had three minutes to, um, to like give my speech as to why I was overweight, my story. I sat at the exact same seat, at the exact same table with the exact same casting director as Toma. So we were just an hour apart from each other. So that, that was kind of cool. Um, I gave him my three minutes, left, and thought, well, that was a waste of 20 minutes. Or that was a waste of a day, you know, of a Saturday. I drove three hours up and thought, gosh, that was pitiful. Where's the nearest Portillo? So, you know, I'm like, because I mean, let's be honest, I was on the big, I was trying to get on the biggest loser, not the bachelorette. So I wanted a hot dog, you know? So I left, went got my hot dog, started down the road. I was 20 minutes down the road and I get this phone call. Hey, Sonia, this is Stacy from Biggest Loser. Would you come to an open casting call, a one-on-one -on -one meeting in downtown Chicago on Tuesday? And I thought, sure. So what started out as a one-on-one -on -one meeting that was supposed to last 20 minutes, lasted two hours, and um, it was amazing. I actually had to start putting together this video, um, and did you have a clip of that? She has here? amazing video editing capabilities. You're going to take a look at it right now. Hello? Is this thing on? Well, if it is, hi, my name is Sonya Jones and I'm the season 16 Biggest Loser. See, I used to be able to play soccer two games, one day. Now I can barely go for two minutes. That's a real drag. I start my morning every day, probably about 6.45 in the morning, I come in and the first thing I do is I get on the scale. And this morning I got on the scale and it said, one at a time, please. One of the things that's hard about being a softball coach and being this size is trying to hit batting practice, trying to sh demonstrate drills, get down, show them how to field a uh, ground ball and then throw with all of this. It's a lot harder than, than it looks. Um, a lot of times during games, I would go and sit in the dugout instead of be walking around and coaching. Um, fortunately, it didn't hurt my team, but it was definitely an embarrassment to me. I also want to say that from this angle, I have more chins than a Chinese phone book. And being Asian, that's a whole lot of chins. Trust me, I know. Over there, stop when you get to the cone. All right? This is race pace, as hard as you can go. Drive your arms, get your toes up, get your knees up, ready? Set. Set. Go. Hey, catch them! Catch them! Let's go! Let's go! In the words of the great philosopher Tommy Boy, fat girl in a little coat. You know, I'm a physical education teacher. I'm a track coach. I'm a softball coach. I should be the model of health and fitness for my kids. Unfortunately, I feel like a complete embarrassment. I'm the biggest track coach at every track meet. I'm the biggest softball coach at almost every softball game. And when I go to PE conferences, I definitely stand out and I'm tired of that. I need your help to really help me get healthy again. 
I've tried to challenge her before to, to go a whole day without saying something negative about her weight or how she feels about that. And she won't even agree to try. <laughs> I wish she would. Um, but I know that her weight is on her mind every day when she wakes up. And I know that she thinks maybe this will be the day that I can turn this around and make a difference. And um, I just think it would be incredible for her to have an opportunity like Biggest Loser because she makes a difference for so many others. It would just be so great to see her get the chance to have someone help her make that difference. And I guarantee you that not only would Biggest Loser be great for her, she would be great for you. You would not be the same after meeting Zanya Jones. You're going to have a lot of contestants come before you through video and through um, through the you know 800,000 people that were standing in line the other day. But I got to tell you, I'm going to be different. I'm going to be a person that stands before you with integrity. I'm going to be a person that stands before you, a person of honesty. And I'm going to tell you that I'm going to be the type of person that's going to go at this hardcore. My work environment, they're super supportive. My kids um, at the school, they are super supportive. And I got to tell you, this community will get behind me 100%. And I hope that you will choose me to be on The Biggest Loser Season 16. Thanks again for taking the opportunity to get to know me. And I hope to see you very soon. Thanks. You have to sit in front of that camera, and what they want is real, you know? And that's the first time I've really done that. It's the first time I've really had that, that much vulnerability. And so, getting back to your question, once I had that completed, I sent it off and I waited. And uh, heard nothing for about two and a half to three weeks, and then they called back and said, you know, it was a lot of applications and all that stuff, but um, they called at the beginning of June and said, we're flying you to California. What I knew is that they um, were taking 50 or 60 people, and um, they were going to keep about a third of them. So when I left on June 9th, I didn't know if I was staying for um, five days or for five months. So I packed up and I left and uh, flew to casting finals. So they they end up they whittle it down from the thousands. It, it was it 80,000, 80,000, yeah. uh, down to 50 or 60 people, and uh, that are to come out to LA. Yep. You're out in LA now. How do they whittle it down from there? What happens after that? Man, that point? we got to LA and it was tons of um, appointments, doctors' appointments. They need to make sure that you're healthy enough. Um, nutritionist, you meet with her. You meet with. Um, NBC executives and producers and all kinds of people because they typecast, you know, they want the right people to make good TV. Um, so I was sequestered in a room for 12 days. The only time I could leave was with a casting PA, which is a production assistant. So I'm in my room the whole time and basically they are, you know, weeding people out. So they're trying to get down to what we found out was the top 20 contestants and throughout that 12 day process, um, they were whittling people down. Weeding people out that could handle being sequestered for that. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right. And when you have ADD, that's not easy. Yeah. So what was that like? 12 days sequestered, no contact with anybody? You were telling me earlier, no contact with friends, family, or anything like that? During this out. time, during casting finals, we could have our phones still. Um, so I was still able to have my phone, so I didn't go completely crazy. Um, but here's what I did during that time. I knew that if I was going to be on The Biggest Loser that I was going to lose weight. That was a no-brainer. They were, that's what you do. You know, no one goes on there and doesn't lose weight. Um, but what I did during that time is I knew that if this was going to be my journey, that this time I had to be focused on getting my foundation right. So I spent all of my time, um, I hardly ever turned on the, the TV. I spent my time um, in reading my Bible, devotions, scripture, worship times, prayer, because um, I wanted to make sure that as I went into this, that I got me right. It's not just about a physical transformation. It hasn't been since day one. It's about making sure that I set the time aside to make sure that I am transformed, not just physically, but spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. So I took that time to focus on my relationship with Christ. And one of the things you find out about Sonia is, uh, and we're going to get to it a little bit here, more of her spiritual story about how where that all began and how she got to that point. But she came into this as a person of faith, a person with that as part of her foundation, uh, which is probably decidedly different than some of the other contestants that she dealt with as well. So you're in sequester sequestration for 12 days. At the end of that 12 days, what happens? Man, it was it was a Saturday night or a Saturday morning, and I get this text or this call, and they're like, "Okay, we need to see you guys um, at 
you know, six o'clock, and I text my friends, I'm like, um, I think I made it, I don't know, but I think I made it, so they take us all into this room, and they're standing in front of us just like this, but they split us in half, they're like, okay, we need these people on this side, we need these people on that side, and we're like, no way, how is this going on? And Joel Melanthagos is the executive producer, he's amazing, I love him, and he's like, you know, this is a tough call, some people make it, some people don't, and he looks at this side and he's like, but that's not the case here. You all made it, we all go crazy, and JJ bursts into tears, because that's what JJ does. And so there is my group. That's season 16 of The Biggest Loser Cast, except for Matt, because Matt always had to go to the bathroom. So Matt's not in this picture, because he's always got to go to the bathroom. So, I appreciate you saying that. Oh yeah, he doesn't care, he doesn't care. So yeah, that's how it Jump into the ranch. Now, what, that was a quick time turnaround. So you're in and now off to the ranch. Yep. And we hear about the ranch. Yeah. I wanna, can I go to the ranch? Can we go to the ranch? You absolutely can. Oh, really? You can pull straight in and um, drive around. Excellent. So what's, what's life like on the ranch? What'd you do there? What was that all about? They talked about all the time you see it on TV. Yep. What was your experience like? There's not a typical day at the ranch. There's just not. It, it depends on what they had going for us that day. For me, I was always up by 644, 44 is my number. So I was always up by then, but um, I would, there's a difference between dark days, which are days we don't film, and days that, that we film. So I'd wake up, I would do my morning prayer walk every morning, um, and we would literally, whether it was a dark day or a film day, we would work out six to eight hours a day. That's no joke. Um, that's how much we would work out. Um, not all at once. So basically I'd get up, I would, um, I would work out, I would eat, digest for about 45, 50 minutes, work out, eat, digest, work out, eat, digest, and I mean, it was just, it was crazy, you know, after my last workout, we'd hang out with the cast, do my devotions, and I was done, you know, I was done. On camera workout days is the same as a dark day, but you have to fit in two to three hours of interviews on top of the the shooting because the stuff you guys literally only saw like one one hundredth of what we actually do um, so they, they did a lot of filming but basically a workout day you just have to do interviews also and then there were challenge days challenge days we hated challenge days basically because you look like this mess on national tv um, oh that canyon cross lord help me hey, this is all on youtube also it is it's everywhere it's crazy. Um, that was awful, but we hated challenge days because I think Sand Mountain Mountain started. So I'll talk more about Sand Mountain later, but that was in episode one, and I have to tell you, it was awful. And I think it scarred us forever. I thought I would die on, on Sand Mountain Day. So challenge days, we didn't work out as much because we were never really sure how much, how much energy we had to consume. Because if it was a brutal day, you didn't want to work out for four hours, then you'll have to try to perform at a challenge and then and then go from there. So there's that was a cool challenge day, but did any of you see this episode, the football episode where Jen and I tried to catch footballs? Yeah. Brutal. I mean, we look like the Helen Keller Academy of Sports. It was terrible. So and that's us with Donald Driver. And then the next one was saw in the video earlier, she's an interior designer, um, and like she knows all the different colors. Well, to me, blue is blue. If you're gonna wear purple, wear purple. I don't care what shade it is. Pink is pink. Fuchsia, what is that? Who cares? Who cares? So you have to like take these pegs and put them in, and by the time I got back to the mud pit, I didn't care. I just wanted to jump in the mud. So, challenge days were brutal. Now, we were talking earlier, and I want to, I want you to share a little bit about part of your faith story. Sure. Um, just brief testimony about how you came to faith and, uh, and developed that. But I was telling Sonia about us, and part of our connection as a church, what we're trying to do, we started this church with the vision to be a catalyst for transforming the spiritual landscape of our community. And we've talked about how we do that, and that there's a, there's a method to that, that there's a strategy of identifying seven key areas of in those areas of the community. And if we as a church family, if we as people of faith can uh, be influencers of sharing hope, adding value into those areas, we will transform the spiritual landscape of our community. Now, Sonia, you've had two 
Uh, we have two of those in particular that you've had an opportunity to be influential in as a teacher in the education system. Uh, so I'm curious about how you bring your faith into that. And then also this unique experience on national TV, the, the media, and that world, which is a totally different world, and how you interacted with people there, and how you brought your faith into that, how being a Christian affected your everyday life in this whole experience. So that's a loaded question of all kinds of stuff. It is. How did my Christianity play out? Okay. Um, my, let me just as a blanket statement say that my faith to me is, is everything. Um, and it's not just about faith to me. Um, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit later. But for me, it is not about being the title of a Christian. It's about being a follower of Jesus. Um, and for me, I want to... I want to share that with as many people who, who will listen. Um, how did my Christianity affect my everyday life at the ranch is in, in several ways. Um, you know, I would have the opportunity to just hang with people and, and talk about things, pray with people. Um, Rhonda Lee and uh, Rhonda Lee, Lori, and I would pray together before at every way. And that's just the, that's what we did. Um, we would have worship times together. JJ early on was like, hey, I have a guitar and can you get some worship music for us? So my best friend sent us some, gosh, I love that guy. Um, you know, he, he, would you send us some chord charts? He sent us chord charts. And we'd be sitting around after weigh-ins because you can't get gross after weigh-ins because you have to do, um, you know, interviews. And we just play music and we would um, sing together and stuff. I had a lot of opportunities to pray with the cast about different things that we were going through. Um, people were homesick, you know, sicknesses, injuries, things like that. But I think, and I think what's key to what you guys are doing, I think the major way that my Christianity, the way that I play out, not just at the ranch, but in general, is my relationships. Um, I built some amazing relationships at the ranch, and two in particular stand out. The first one is with Woody. Woody's my guy, man. I, I love Woody. Um, Woody is, when Woody came to the ranch, for those of you who, who don't really know the story, Woody lost his wife nine months before he came to the ranch to cancer. Woody's an amazing man. I've um, been through a lot. And he came to the ranch a very broken man. Um, his wife was his whole world. And he's sitting there. And I remember sitting and looking across the way. And he's looking at the table like, how did you make that? I'm not sure that Woody ever made his own meals. Because either his family made it for him or his wife or whomever. Um, I remember he and Jen and I were sitting outside one day and he was just sharing a really dark time in his life that he he just felt like God intervened on, on his behalf and I remember we're sitting there and he's I, I've got my Bible in, in my bag pocket or in my bag and he was talking about this dark time and he said you know I looked over and I saw this Bible and I started to read it and he's like it saved my life and I'm like what do you do you have a Bible here and he's like no he's like I, I didn't bring one so I had an extra Bible and I picked it up handed it to him. I said, man, you do now. I said, you, you need to read this. And from that day forward, Woody started reading his Bible like 20 to 30 minutes a day. And I knew that it was impacting him because he'd come downstairs and he'd be like, okay, when Jesus said this, what was he talking about? Or why did Jesus say, okay, he did these miracles. He'd say, but don't tell anybody. He's like, what's that about? You know, and we'd have these conversations and Woody and I grew so close. We were on the ranch together a long time and we just shared a lot of you know just personal things together and um, I think that's one way but I think another way um, another relationship is my trainer Jen um, most of America knew that she and I developed a great friendship that still continues I mean she was in my home last week you know we were hanging out last week and what you didn't see is the hours and hours of conversation that went into that friendship and how it formed um, when I first got to be the biggest loser what I what I knew is that there was Bob, Dolvet, and Jillian. Those were the, the three trainers, for those of you who watched in years past. Well, I wanted Dolvet as my trainer. And I gotta tell you, he is a single, good-looking black man <laughs> that I thought single is the operative word. Dolvet has to be my trainer, you know? So I'm like, yes! I'm gonna have Dolvet as my trainer, this is gonna be awesome. And then we get to the LA Coliseum that night, and I'm like, who is this Jesse Pavel? Because he looks good too. You know, I mean, I could be on that man's team. He looked good, you know? So I'm thinking, gosh, this is a win win for me. Is this your engagement picture? Yes, he's getting over me. And, you know, he's saying, work, will you marry me? He's already married, so that's not good. That's bad for 
business, you know. So anyway, and then this woman named Jen Wiederstrom starts talking. Wiederstrom starts talking, and I'm like, okay, who is this person? And I gotta tell you, when she started talking, started talking about her philosophy and training and the way that she deals with people, it was like God spoke to my heart and said, she's gonna be your trainer. And I thought, God, have you seen Dolvet's abdominal muscles? <laughs> because that's what I'm leaning towards right now. I know why. But it was like he spoke to my heart and said, no, this, this, is, this is where you're going. I thought, well, I'll love to see how all this pans out. Sand Mountain happens. We, we get to Sand, Sand Mountain. There's 20 of us, okay? There's 20 people. And there's only 18 spots up there. And I'm like, oh no, two people are going home today. We didn't know about Comeback Canyon. We, we didn't know any, any of that. So I'm sitting there, and Allie, Allison Sweeney says to me, she says, Sonia, if you get up to the top of that hill today, who are you going to choose? And I said, Allie, it's going to sound weird, but for me, I, I, I felt this instant connection with Jen. I said, I, I felt like that's who, who needs to, to be my trainer. Sand Mountain starts. I get up that first hill, and I thought, this is awful. L little background about Sand Mountain. They, they use it every year. Sand Mountain, they use it every single year. But they usually wait until episode 9 or 10 because it's so hard. I mean, when you're going up that sand, it's loose sand, so you step, your foot gets covered, you kind of slide back a little bit. So I'm trying to jump over these obstacles, and it's brutal. I get up the first set. I get down the next set with this medicine ball, and then, oh my gosh, I start back up, up the third mountain. And I'm like, I don't think I can do this. And I'm getting, I get over the third one, and I'm laying over this ball, and I'm praying, I'm like, God, you have to help me get up this mountain. I said, because there's there's no way I can do this on my own, and I'm praying, and I'm laying over this ball, which is not nearly as flattering of a picture as you would think it would be, because this is a whole lot of woman laying over this medicine ball. And I hear these words, I'm like, and I hear Jen say, Sonia. I looked up at her, she said, you said you wanted me, now come get me. Let's go. And I looked at her, she's like, come on. Pick up that ball, I charge up that mountain. I take, I take that ball and I throw it into this tub and I collapsed on her. And she took my, my head and she put it in, in her hands. And she said, honey, she said, you did it. She's like, and I knew you could. She's like, and you know that connection you talked about? I said, yeah. She said, I felt it too. She's like, and this starts our journey together. And that is where God really started to peel back the layers in our relationship as a trainer, but also as our relationship as a friend. She's one of my dearest friends. I mean, you know, we, we talk a lot. Um, and what God is doing in my life and in hers is, is phenomenal. And that's all thanks to The Biggest Loser, but thank, thankful, you know, that's all based on his faithfulness. So, and, and you know, listen, those opportunities are around all of us all yeah. the time. And but she, you could hear that she came into this experience not knowing what was there, but had the determination that she was going to be open to what open doors God uh, had for her, the relationships, and those opportunities to meet people. And, and that's when God uses us. Um, so that's a pretty significant thing. And that, that relationship continued to develop. You had a pretty significant event birthday I did, uh, during yes. the, the taping of the whole thing. Want to yeah. talk about that a little bit? Sure. You know, I um, turned 40 on the ranch. Who gets to do that? Um, we were the most sequestered cast ever because we didn't know about Comeback Canyon. I had no idea that Bob was still on the show. Um, so we didn't get to talk to our families. It was week 15 until I saw anyone. Um, my best friend, we would get letters, but that's it. They were all screened. There were parts that were marked out, you know. Yeah, it was all, it was crazy. So um, we're walking around the ranch after my, or the week before my 40th birthday. And Jen says to me, she says, Okay, now that you know about Comeback Canyon, you know about all this, she's like, what do you want to do for your birthday? I said, can I be honest with you? She's like, no, I prefer that you lie to me. I'm like, oh, yeah, stupid question. Um, she, I said, I want to go to church. I said, it's, it's such an important part of my life. It's where I go and I get filled up to go back out. I said, church, church is so important to me. I said, and I want to go to church. I said, and there's a bucket list church that I, I want to go to. I said, I want to go to Hillsong's church. It's in Hillsong, not Songs, uh, Hillsong Church. It's in LA, and, and I want to go. She gets out her phone. She's like, she's like texting. She's like, hi guys, um, Simon wants to go to church for her 40th birthday. Can we make this happen? Jen. She comes bounding in like three hours later, and she's like, it's happening. We're going to church, and, and I get to take you. And I'm like, oh, 
It was amazing. So uh, the next slide is me, the, the group who went. So there's me, Jen, Kelly is the is one of our uh, athletic trainers. Woody went, and then Brian, who is a um, who's a casting PA, or he's, he's one of our production assistants. Great, great people. So we go, and that morning I I, I was walking the mile, and I was praying. I'm like, God, I don't really want to do anything to make people uncomfortable. I know what worship will be like, but I don't really want to make people uncomfortable. So I'm just gonna chill. I'm not gonna raise my hands and stuff. And I was like, God spoke very clearly, and He said, No, this day, this is about us. This is about you and me. So we get to Hill Songs and music start. Hill Song and music starts. And so I just raise my hands. I start worshiping like normal. And I look over at one point. Woody has his hands raised and he's got his head back and he's singing and it's beautiful. Especially because if you've ever heard Woody sing, wow, he can sing. So it, it was it was a beautiful moment. And I look at Jen and she's crying. And I said, Honey, what's wrong? And she said, She said, I haven't stopped crying since the music started. She's like, This is an amazing experience. So, um, as we get through worship, I realize, Pastor, if you don't know the, the story of Hillsong, Hillsong is actually a, in Sydney, Australia, and there's a church plant from Hillsong. They're all over the, the country, and they started one in L.A., and I love Hillsong. I always have. Pastor Brian, who's from Sydney, just happened to be there that day. It just happened to be, to, to be there that day, and he gets up and he starts preaching this message. He's talking about Christianity, and he says, you know, he says, you know, how many of you feel like Christianity is just a set of rules, a set of shackles, it's just a set of bondage where, you know, it's rules and, and regulations that, that you have to follow. And then he goes in to say, how many of you feel like the walls of this church would fall in today because you, you walked through the door? And it was so funny because Jen looks at me and she's like, did you tell them we were coming? I'm like, no, I swear to God. You know, but he starts talking about how there's true freedom in a relationship with Christ. And it's not about rules. It's not about regulations. It's about falling in love with a Savior who is crazy about you and how there's so much freedom in Christ. And that day, on my 40th birthday, I was standing there when some of my friends and a whole group of other people who were at Hillsongs that day either raised their hand for salvation or for recommitment. And I gotta tell you, it was the best birthday ever because I was standing in a room when people gave their heart to the Lord or recommitted their life to the Lord. So that was an amazing experience. It was the best birthday of my life. Awesome, awesome. Now, we gotta get to this. I wanna make sure that we get to this. This is kind of the... The, the movie moment here that we want to show you here, the, the finale. If you remember the finale of this whole deal, do, uh, you got so close. So, you remember Missed this? it by that much. <laughs> well, I mean, man, I, I want you to talk about the, your finale experience, but take a look at this and remember that the, the winner of this isn't about pounds lost, it's about percentage over the course of the whole time from when they started to when they end. How many, the percentage of weight loss that you have and, uh, and this is what happened. Take First up, this. she was the biggest loser on the ranch. Let's see if she can keep the crown. Remember, it's not just about the pounds that you've lost. It's about your total percentage of weight loss. That will determine who will become the next biggest loser and win the grand prize. Sonia, when you first came to campus, your starting weight was 283 pounds. Your current weight is... competition at 336 pounds. All that pain, sweat, the tears comes down to this moment. To win, you need to have lost more than 170 pounds. Toma, your current weight is.
Is that yeah. crazy? So talk about that, what was going on there. <laughs> Can you talk about this? Well, you know, it wasn't for me. I mean, I don't know. Um, you know, when I was in Kauai, in episode 13, 14, Jen and I adopted a phrase, and it was, why not us? Why not me? Why not me to win this whole thing? Why not her to win as a trainer in her first year? Why not us to do it together because we become great friends? You know, let's do this. And there's a lot of drive in that statement. You know, why not me? When, when I'm doing burpees, when I am on the rowing machine, why not me? Do it, go after it. There's a lot of drive in that. Then that moment happened, and I'm laying in bed that Thursday night, Friday morning, and I'm laying there and I'm thinking, God, why not me? Why didn't I win that? Why not me? And it took a whole new meaning. And what I realized when I lost by 0.01%, I realized some things. I may not have won $250,000, but I won. I'm not on medicine anymore. I feel amazing. I, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm healthy for the first time in my life. And I'm starting to love this person that God created. Um, I put everything I had into winning that com competition. If you had told me three minutes before I walked on that stage, <clears throat> excuse me, that I wasn't going to win, I would have said you're crazy. Because what I had to know is that I didn't beat myself. If Rob or Toma were, were going to beat me, that's okay, because it took a good man to, to do it. Because I'm telling you what, I put everything I could in, in that competition. But I had to stand on that scale and know that I hadn't beat myself. Allie asked me right before, before um, his, his number came up, she said, what, what, what are you thinking right now? I said, regardless of what that scale says, we all won. And I'm a coach. I stand, I stood in front of the kids that following week, and I had to say to them, you have to win with integrity, you have to lose with integrity, and it is really about how you play the game. You know, it's not always about the wins and losses, because did I win up $250,000? Nope, but I won. I have friends now who I will spend eternity with. I have a group of people who are my forever family now. I'm healthy. I won. You know, I may not have won the, the, the prize money, but there's so much more beyond that that, that I did win. Maybe we can take, take up a collection to get that $250,000. Yeah, sign that spell with a Y. It's a little Y. Something from the heart. Yeah. <laughs> you know, help us just <laughs> That's right. You know, so we're kicking this series off, uh, Getting Healthy Again. And the, the principles of getting healthy again are, are in the Bible. Yeah. It, 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 it's all right there. And now, maybe not a fitness regimen or anything like that, or dietary stuff necessarily, but specifically what we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks are the eight statements that Jesus made in one of his most famous sermons, the Sermon on the Mount. And the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, is a section called the Beatitudes. So these are principles uh, for healthy living, but they're not just principles, they're actually steps. So for the next eight weeks, we're going to be walking through those steps. And that first step, though, so if you want to write this down, just as a one other takeaway for today, is the first step to getting healthy is to admit that I need God's help. That's where it begins. It doesn't matter if you're talking about physical health. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a relational issue. It doesn't matter if you're talking about uh, some kind of addiction that you're going through or financial, whatever it might be. The first step to getting healthy again is to say, God, I need your help. And that's the first step. And it's the hardest one is to take that initial step. You know, we, we struggle with wanting to do things, things that we know that we're supposed to do. We all probably know the right foods that we're supposed to eat and the, the exercise that we're supposed to do. But we keep doing the things that we don't want to do. And the only way to get over that hump and to get healthy again is to say, God, I need your help. I can't do this on my own. So, Sonia, I was just wondering if you could talk uh, just about your first step, that, that audition tape that you put together, that, that first step. What was the hardest part? What, what has impacted your life? Um, not only just your life on the show, but your life in general about taking, because there's two things that we're talking about here. There's the physical stuff sure. that we see here, but then there's that bigger picture that you keep coming back to that's woven throughout your story about what God has done in your life, the step that you took to follow Him. I think for me, it comes down to one word, and that's real. I had to get real. 
I had to become vulnerable for the first time in my life. I'm not a vulnerable person. I'm not a person, I'm really good at this. The number one thing that the people said to me, and, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, is that people didn't know how much I struggled with who I was. Um, when, when you heard me say, I don't like who I am, the first time that people who were close to me heard that was on national TV. And the emails that, that I got signed, we never knew. We never knew. Um, so I, I, think, I think there has to come a point when you have to be okay with living beyond the facades. You have to let the walls come down and you have to say, here I am, warts and all, and God, this is, you created me, he knows who I am, he loved me, I had to get to one where I loved me. So this whole experience, what, what is it? What, what's God doing in your life? What, what kinds of things have you learned? How have you grown in your relationship with, with him and what he's doing in your life? There's two major things that God shared with me about this journey that I am so grateful for. When I was on the plane ride from Chicago to L.A., I was a jumble of emotions. You, you know, you, you talk about first steps and stuff. And I was so, I was anxious. I was excited. I didn't know how long I was going to be gone. I'm leaving my friends and my family. And I was just, ugh. I just knew that I had to pray. And there were two things that the God showed me on that plane ride at 37,000 feet up over the Grand Canyon that I'm forever grateful for because it's stuff that he's still working on in my life. <clears throat> Number one is that for the first time in my life, this was, he spoke to me that this is believing for the first time ever what he said is true in Psalm 139, 13 and 14, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, most people didn't know how much I struggled with me. Um, I, I kept that in. I, I didn't let people in. So I realized how much that came. There, there's a picture for the Sun Times that, that we're gonna pop up. And it's a picture of me in a purple shirt right there. I am in one of the most intense coaching moments in my life. This game gets us into the state championship. I'm waving a girl around, we're down five to two. There's a girl who just, there's two people on, two runners on. There's a girl that just hit a ball to the right center gap. I'm waving her around from first to third. You see my right arm, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling her around. What's my left arm doing? My left arm is pulling out my shirt because subconsciously, I don't want people to see that my shirt is tucked in a front row. You know, I mean, so I knew at that point that, my gosh, this is consuming me. Even subconsciously, this is something that, that controls me. I'm pretty good at taking God at his word, especially for other people. It's very easy for me to hold a newborn baby and know that newborn baby is fearfully and wonderfully made. It's easy for me to look at someone who looks like Jen. Someone, it's easy for me to look at someone who looks like Dolvet or Jesse. Amen. Can I get an amen? You know, and know that they are fearfully and wonderfully me made. But me, 283 pounds? Come on. I, I, I couldn't I couldn't buy into that. But God spoke those words to me about believing that I was fearfully and wonderfully made on the plane ride to LA. Not when I was done with the process. He loved me when I hated who I was. And I think there's a really valuable point in that. God's love for me didn't grow when I shrunk. What happened is, as I shrunk physically, I was growing mentally and emotionally and spiritually. And I gotta tell you, when I got rid of some of that yuck, I was able to let his love for me come through in a way that I had never known, to accept it in a new way. You know, we all have a lot of yuck in our lives. Some of it's yuck that we never tell people about. You know, we're embarrassed and we feel like it's too much for, for people to handle. Um, and maybe for you, maybe you struggle with self-image. Maybe you don't. Maybe for you it's pride or it's gossip or it's just, it's alcoholism. It's, it's an addiction. Who knows? I got to tell you, you're not alone. Whatever your struggles are, we all have them. Don't feel like you are alone in that. Um, if you come to him, you, you don't have to pretty yourself up. You don't have to come to him and say, okay, God, I, I lost all this weight. Now, here I am. Do with it what you want. No, come to him broken. And he will take those pieces, and he will put them back together. And then you will be better than you ever imagined you could be. The second thing that I think God showed me in that is that, um, on that plane ride, is that this was my mission field. You know, this was where I was going to share the love of Jesus Christ with a group of people who desperately needed it. And that's not saying anything badly about people. That's just 
saying, everybody needs Jesus. So my goal was to go out there and share the love of Christ with other people. And you know, John 3, 16 is very cool. Very clear the fact that God so loved this, you know, loved this world that He gave His only begotten Son for all of us. That's for everyone. And I think our goal here is that we need to take that message out. You know, I love The Biggest Loser, and what I love about it is not the fact that I got to lose weight. I love this. I love who I am. You know, I mean, I could pick up and run to downtown Chicago right now. I love that. But what I love is the fact that everywhere I go across the country. It allows people to come through those doors and listen to someone that they would have never walked through the doors of a church before. And so when you have Jesus, when you have that, that love for people, what you're doing here, it's all about going out. Because if we as Christians are really cool about coming in, hey, this is a great Sunday, all, all over this country, hey, this is great, what we do here is awesome, fantastic, it's awesome, but you're missing it. Get out there, go share the love of Jesus Christ with people because they need it. They desperately need it. So, some of you I know are dealing with enormous pain. And you, you've got an area, so you talk about that. It may not be a weight issue, maybe one of those other issues that she's talked about. And you feel like you're at the end of your rope. You have friends like that. You know people that you interact with all the time. And I'll, what we want to say to people like that is to say congratulations because you're at step one. Step one is recognize that I can't do this on my own. I need help. I need God's help. That's why I love what it says. And blessed are those who realize that they are spiritually helpless. There's a blessing that comes with that. The message paraphrase, I wrote it down in your outline there. It says you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God. And his rule. That's exactly what it's all about. Less of us understand we can't do it on our own. That when we were unable to save ourselves, that's when Christ stepped in. And he said, I will do it for you. I will take care of this for you. That's why Jesus came to the earth, came to earth, is to give us his grace. And his grace is the power to change. And that's what he offers to all of us. The Bible says that God gives power to the faint and he strengthens the powerless. He gives power to the thing. He strengthens the power. So as we close our time here today, I, I want you to think back to what we talked about at the beginning. What is it in your life that is unhealthy right now? Is it your pace of life? Is it a relationship? Is it your diet? Is it your financial situation? Are you holding on to things from the past that you just keep bringing with you everywhere you go? Is it your worries? Is it your habits? Is it some kind of addiction that you have? What is it in your life that needs changing? Don't fool yourself into thinking that there's nothing in your life that needs changing. That's the first step. And I want to invite you to join us over the next eight weeks and bring somebody with you to participate in this series as we take these steps of getting healthy again. But I want to ask you today is are you willing to take your first step? That first step of making the video, that first step of getting on the plane, that step of admitting in front of other people, people that know you the most, you know, even going to your your uh, your employer and stuff saying, hey, I'm going on this show. Well, you know, why? Well, here's what's going on in my life. You begin to open that up and to talk about that. That's the first step. Why is it so hard? It's because, like she talked about, being honest and being uh, forthright with your feelings and facing up to the issues that we deal with uh, that scare us, that, that intimidate us, those, those are hard things to deal with. They're painful, they're scary, and things that we run from and we sweep them under the rug, and, and it takes courage. And so as we close here today, I, I want to pray for you. And I want to pray for us uh, as we take this journey together. And I want to pray for Sonia because she has an enormous opportunity. God's opened up a door for you. And we join with you as the body of Christ. And uh, to, just to, to lift you up, to pray for you. I know that uh, you're opening up doors we're talking about. It's not just doors in the church community, but it's doors yeah, with people that are far from God, that are not even sure about spirituality. She was talking about friends that she met on during the show that just have all different kinds, just like people that we interact with every day, with all different kinds of backgrounds. And it's being willing to be open and to be used by God. And not having all the answers, not beating over the head with the Bible, it's just being able to be a friend and build relationships. And you see where that's taken off with her. Same thing can happen with you as well.